NACDL is the association of the nation's criminal defense bar. When we first had a conversation about whether we should do a stakeholder training and include everyone, part of me was concerned because we're so used to being locked into our adversarial roles and in an adversarial system. And I thought about it a little bit more and I really thought about the fact that we all look at the issue of a fair cross section from our own silos and from our own paths and our own um, practices. But I think it's time to tear down some of those silos. I think it's time for us to have the conversation that is hard to be had. And that is that we have an issue with having an, uh, an overrepresentation of white jurors and we're not being inclusive in our jury panels and in our jury pools. And we've all seen this in our practice anecdotally. Our state has studied it at some different points in time. Back in 1993, our state took a first look at the representation of non-white people in our jury pools, and they found that there was a disparity rate of about 45%. Since that time, most recently, it was looked at again in 2000 and 2021, and the needle has not moved very much. So this is an issue that we've been studying on a higher level uh, at the head of our departments for about 30 years. It's been something that we've been experiencing as practitioners um, as long as I've been practicing. And I think it's time for all of us to have a conversation about it. I think this is an issue that we all truly care about. I think we all want fair and diverse juries. I think this is something that is an opportunity for us to really come together on and take a look at it, have a conversation and, see what we can do. So I guess that what I would ask is that we bring some curiosity to the table and that we bring some openness to new possibilities and working together and tearing down the silos and, and look at this from all perspectives. So to that end, I wanna introduce our panel to you. The flow of this uh, webinar today will be such that Nina Chernoff, who is a professor from CUNY University School of Law, will be doing the bulk of our presentation in terms of the substantive law and the statistics and the practices around the country regarding the fair cross-section of the jury. And Nina is going to do a presentation for us first for about 40 to 50 minutes. Then we're gonna turn it over to our panel. We've got a fantastic panel here today for you as well. We have Zanelle Brown, who is the court administrator in Detroit. She is also an author and an attorney and brings her experience and has watched the evolution of the Detroit system come to change. So she will be speaking with us later on. We also have Danielle Viola, who is uh, an attorney and a judge in Maricopa County, Arizona. She's the chair of the jury task force committee in Arizona, and she will bring her experience uh, to the table Table as well. We also have John Choi, who's our very own county attorney here in Minnesota. He's the first born uh, Korean American attorney, county attorney, and he is the county attorney in Ramsey County. So um, with that, I invite you all to enjoy the presentation. Please put your questions and comments and put your questions in the Q&A as we go through. We do have some time reserved at the very end for Q&A and I will do some light Q&A during Nina's presentation before we open it up to a panel conversation that involves all of us. Um, and I just wanna say uh, what is truly great about everyone who's joined the webinar today is that it's a great representation of judges, of prosecutors, defense lawyers, greater Minnesota and um, from the Twin Cities area Metro. So I'm very excited for everyone's experiences to be um, brought to the table and to have this conversation. With that, I will stop yapping as I tend to do and turn it over to Nina. Great, thank you, Corey. Well, I thank you so much to everyone who's attending this. It's wonderful to be together, even virtually, with so many people who are uh, interested in and committed to jury diversity. So I'm gonna share my screen now and uh, give you an overview of, of what I'm planning. Um, in this presentation, I'm going to address why exactly jury diversity matters so much, as well as the evidence, some of which Corey alluded to, that juries in Minnesota and nationally tend to underrepresent people of color 
And then look at the uh, legal framework for challenging juries that underrepresent people of color with a particular focus on the right to a jury selected from a fair cross section. Then I'll describe some of the ways that the invisible or behind the scenes stages of jury selection can interfere with our ability to achieve that fair cross section goal. And I'll close with some recommendations for the jury selection process in Minnesota. But in case you can't stay for the full presentation or if that sounds like way more information about juries, then you wanna sign up for, I'll skip to the punchline, which is jury diversity is not an intractable problem. There are changes that states and courts can make that will increase diversity in their community. So let me start by asking a question and there's a few different places today where I'm gonna ask a question, ask you to respond in the chat, just as a way of connecting across the internet here. In your mind, what is the purpose in having juries decide cases? What are the, some of the values um, that are met or recognized when we have juries decide cases. I'm just going to pause for a moment and look in the chat. No values whatsoever. Great transparency. It's your peers making the decision. Multiple people deciding. Group decision making, great. Great, yeah, it's a point that it reflects the community values. Maybe more objective decision making. Yes, these are all uh, sort of values that are enforced or um, enhanced when we have juries deciding cases. And um, I think one of the key points is that a lot of these goals, these purposes of having the, the, the verdict reflect community values or be truly neutral decision-making, those are all values that are only achieved when the jury makeup reflects the community. Um, because you know one of the uh, important values in jury diversity is that it enhances public confidence in the verdicts that those juries reach and therefore in the justice system as a whole. So that's one of the reasons that jury diversity matters so much. And one of the examples of this link between jury diversity and public confidence in the verdicts comes from a study of uh, more than 300 jury eligible individuals. The study used a hypothetical of a black defendant who was charged with shoplifting and asked the respondents to read about the trial and the verdict and then rate the verdict as fair or unfair. And the researchers tested four different versions of this hypo. In half of the hypos, the defendant was acquitted and in half he was convicted. And in some of the hypos, the jury was described as all white. And in some of the hypos, the jury was described as racially mixed. And here's what they found. When the jury was racially mixed, people rated a conviction and an acquittal as equally fair. In other words, the racially mixed jury was seen as a fair enough process that any outcome was seen as fair. But when the jury was all white, uh, people rated the conviction as significantly less fair. In other words, the all white jury meant that respondents didn't trust the outcome where the government prevailed over the defendant. And the fairness of the criminal justice system is at the forefront of so many of our minds in this moment in history. Uh, this is a point where both black and white people uh, the majority of both black and white people believe that black people are treated less fairly than whites by the criminal justice system. And although that recognition cuts it across racial and ethnic groups, people of color report even more skepticism about the fairness of the justice system. A 2021 report in Minnesota found that only one in 10 black and indigenous Minnesotans believe that the courts and criminal justice system treat members of their racial or ethnic identity fairly just about always or even most of the time. I'm not sure if this was in the chat, but it turns out that the increased public confidence in the verdicts of diverse juries is well placed for a couple of reasons. And uh, one of which is that those verdicts are uh, likely to lead to less biased, uh, are likely to be less biased. And I think I saw in the chat a reference to more neutral decision-making and the evidence bears that out. The most thorough study of this phenomenon comes from a study of 785 criminal trials, felony trials in Florida over a 10 year period. It was uh, conducted by economists at Duke University. Uh, 
The study looked at juries that were drawn from an all white veneer, that is an all white group of about 27 people uh, from which individual pettit juries were selected and compared their verdicts to juries that were selected from a veneer that included even just one black person. And what they found over those 700 trials was that the juries that were drawn from the all white veneer convicted black and white defendants at strikingly different rates. Those juries convicted 81% of black defendants and 66% of white defendants. And this racial disparity, this gap in conviction rates by race disappeared when the jury had been selected from a veneer that included even one black person. And on those juries, the uh, convictions rate for black and white defendants was roughly equal. As the researchers concluded, the black white conviction gap declined in all trials where there was at least one black person in the jury pool. And what's particularly interesting about this study is that African-Americans made up only 4% of the um, population. This says jury pool, 4% of the population in the Florida counties that were studied. And so the study demonstrates that even small changes in the composition of the jury pool can have a large impact. And this is significant because some of the changes that Minnesota could make might have a uh, small impact in terms of raw numbers, but it can make a big difference to equity. The second reason that public confidence in verdicts reached by diverse juries is also justified is that there's empirical data demonstrating that the quality of deliberations is higher when the jury is a diverse group. This, this data comes from a series of studies conducted uh, by Dr. Samuel Summers that compared the deliberation process of a six person jury that included six white people with the deliberation process of a six person jury that included four white people and two black people. And I wanna ask you now, before I turn to the results um, about your own expectations about the differences between these white juries and the racially diverse juries. And you could think about it to yourself. I'd be curious if you wanna put one of the letters in the chat. What is your expectation? Which of these um, results do you expect to see from Okay, discuss more case facts, that's one. If we were in person, I could be making meaningful eye contact with you as we do this, but now I'm just going to wait. Okay, some of these there is support for. Great. Well, jumping to the results, what they found was that the uh, racially mixed juries were uh, deliberated for longer. They discussed a wider range of evidence. So they discussed a higher number of case facts. They made fewer factual errors and they were more likely to correct the errors that they did make. And they were more likely to discuss racial issues such as racial profiling. And what's particularly interesting is that it was the behavior of white jurors that changed the most. And you can see in this chart, which compares the conduct of white jurors who are part of a diverse jury group and white jurors who were part of an all white jury group. And um, you can see that the white jurors who were on diverse juries themselves raised more case facts, made fewer factual errors and raised more race related issues. For example, you can see that white jurors on diverse juries made about four factual errors as compared to white jurors on all white juries that made about seven factual errors. The researchers concluded that jury representativeness might be more than a moral ideal or a constitutional ideal. It can really be an ingredient for superior performance. You can get people who are doing a better job at the task they're assigned to do, which is deliberate the case. And I would assume that for folks in Minnesota, even if you didn't have these studies at your fingertips that you would wouldn't be surprised to hear that diverse juries produce better verdicts or that they increase public confidence in the system. I mean, for one thing, as early as 1993, the Minnesota Supreme Court Task Force on Racial Bias in the Judicial System reached a number of conclusions, including that the ethnic, racial, and sexual makeup of a jury affects the outcome of cases. And the point that echoes some of the observations in the chat that um, juries need to have people of color to really reflect the community if the jury's verdict is going to serve the purpose of reflecting the community's judgment. And of course, you were aware of the national reaction to the diverse jury selected for the Derek Chauvin case and how the diversity of that jury seemed to reassure many members of the public that there was going to be a fair trial. So the trouble is that even though the data and 
some of our own life experiences tell us that the system works better if juries are representative. Across the country, jury pools underrepresent uh, people of color and overrepresent white people. And that mismatch is unfolding against the reality nationwide that people of color are disproportionately overrepresented in the pool of criminal defendants. So the most recent national data comes from an assessment of juries in the federal courts. And that assessment found that underrepresentation of the Latino and African-American populations is ubiquitous. In fact, 40% of African-American or black people are not included in our community's federal jury pool. And 30% of Hispanic or Latinx people are not included in our community's federal jury pool. So what about Minnesota? What do we know? Well, we know that almost 30 years ago, the same uh, Supreme Court task force found that people of color are overrepresented in the number of individuals arrested and prosecuted, as well as in the number of individuals who are victims. People of color waiting for justice or judgment abound. Yet somehow people of color on the other side of the courtroom in the jury box are very hard to find. In fact, jury pools are rarely, if ever, representative of the racial composition of our communities. And I was curious to learn uh, how accurate that feels to you today. In your opinion, you know, how often do the juries in your jurisdiction reflect the diversity of that community? I'm just gonna open the chat for me, so. Seeing some sometimes and some almost nevers or frequently. Some nevers. After the meeting is over, I think I'll be able to review the chat and tabulate these, but just wanted to get a sense. Certainly a number of people are saying almost never, um, which, and presumably it's some concern about that, that brought you to take time of your, out of your day for this webinar. Um, what we do know is that although uh, people of color represent at least now 20% of the total population of Minnesota, where people of color is defined as people who identify as a race other than white alone and those who are Hispanic or Latinx. And the most recent data suggests that as is true across the country, Minnesota juries don't reflect uh, this kind of diversity. The 2021 study on jury race data and recommendations by the Committee for Equality and Justice, which was chaired by District Court Judge Wahi and included other judges, as well as representatives from the Attorney General's Office and Legal Services. Their data showed that white non-Hispanic Minnesotans are represented at a higher rate in the jury pool and most other racial groups are underrepresented when compared to the census data. Specifically, white non-Hispanic Minnesotans uh, constitute 83% of the adult population of the state and 89% of the jury pool. And black or African-American residents make up 5.5% of the population but 3.3% of the jury pool. And another way of articulating this, and we'll get to this shortly, is that African-Americans are 40% less likely to be in the jury pool than they would have been if they were proportionately represented. And Hispanic uh, Minnesotans make up 4.3% of the population, but 2.4% of the jury pool. And this underrepresentation of people of color, of course, contrasts with the overrepresentation of these communities in the pool of criminal defendants and people who are incarcerated, where Minnesota ranks fourth in the country for the disparity between black and white incarceration rates, and fifth in the country for the disparity between Hispanic and white incarceration rates. So that's where we are. We know from statistics, studies, and life that uh, diverse juries are better for our justice system, and we have a sense from our experience and from the data that we do have that our juries are disproportionately white. So what does the law have to say about this? What does the law require in terms of jury diversity? So let me first ask you a question. This one is a poll. We're trying out all the technology here. So you'll see a poll coming up soon asking you if the jury system underrepresents people of color, but there is no discrimination at any stage of the jury selection process, can there be a constitutional violation? And so I think Randy is going to launch a poll now. Okay, great. So. I hope that we can all see the results, which about two thirds of us said there can be a constitutional violation and about a third said that there cannot. And the answer is that yes, there can still be 
a constitutional violation, even if there is no discrimination at any stage of the jury selection process. And that's because there are two constitutional rights that apply to jury selection. And the first is the one that usually pops to mind first. That's the right to equal protection of the law, which is the right to a jury process that's free from discrimination. It's housed in the 14th Amendment, which as you know, was passed after the abolition of slavery with a focus on eliminating racial discrimination. The right to equal protection applies to every stage of the jury selection process in both civil and criminal cases. So it would be unconstitutional, say, for example, for a jury clerk to discriminate when deciding um, which juror names to go on the source list. And it's also an equal protection violation for a lawyer to make a peremptory strike on a discriminatory basis. And if there's no discrimination, there's no equal protection violation. But even if there's no discrimination, there can still be a constitutional violation. And that's because there's also a constitutional right to a jury pool selected from a fair cross section of the community under both the federal and Minnesota constitutions. This right is housed in the Sixth Amendment. So like all Sixth Amendment rights, it applies only to criminal prosecutions. Though under Minnesota law, there's a statutory right that applies in civil and criminal cases to a jury selected from the broadest feasible cross section of the community. I wanna highlight three aspects of the fair cross section right that make it different, that distinguish it from the equal protection guarantee. So the first thing to note is that the fair cross section right does not apply to all of the stages of jury selection. And I think that brings us to our second of three poll questions, which I wanna ask you, and Randy, go ahead and launch the poll. Which stage of the jury selection process does not need to include a fair cross section of the community? Okay, interesting. We have a bit of a spread. Um, I think that everyone can see the poll results, um, but most people, 68%, correctly recognize that the one stage of the jury selection process that does not need to include a fair cross section are the jurors on an individual jury. The fair cross section right applies to all of the stages of jury selection before voir dire. So the fair cross section right applies to the source list. Um, it applies to the list of qualified jurors, the list of summons jurors, and the veneer. I'm not sure if that's the word you use in Minnesota, but by that I mean the pool of jurors who arrive at the courthouse on a given day prepared to go through the voir dire process. But the fair cross section right doesn't apply to that voir dire process. So it doesn't apply to four cause challenges to peremptory strikes or to the actual jury that hears that case. So it's probably more accurate to say that the, fair, the Sixth Amendment guarantee, guarantees you not a right to a representative pettit jury to decide your case, um, but it gives you a chance to get a representative group by requiring that every stage of jury selection before voir dire includes a fair cross section of the community. The second important thing to note about the fair cross section right that distinguishes, distinguishes it from equal protection is, as I've noted, there's no discrimination requirement. So the fair cross section right doesn't prohibit us from doing something like discriminating. It imposes an affirmative requirement that we produce something that is a jury that's selected from a fair cross section of the community. And the Sixth Amendment doesn't care if the reason we're not producing that representative group is discrimination or the application of completely race neutral policies. The third thing to note is that the requirements for fair cross section violation and an equal protection violation for proving a violation of one of these rights are different. Not surprisingly, they're from different constitutional amendments were drafted at different moments in history and interpreted by different Supreme Court cases. So a person who's alleging that some stage of the jury selection process doesn't include a fair cross section of the community has to show three things. First, they have to identify a distinctive group in the community. This is generally defined as a group that's defined and limited by some factor through which a common thread in attitude, ideas, or experience runs through. And there needs to be a community of interest between the members of that group such that their interests can't be adequately represented if that group is excluded from the jury selection process. In contrast, for an equal protection violation where the focus is discrimination, you have to identify a group that has been discriminate, discriminated against by law as written or as applied. Second, a person making out a fair cross-section claim has to show that the representation of this distinctive group in the jury system is not fair and reasonable. 
And in equal protection, the plaintiff has to meet a higher burden of showing substantial underrepresentation. Now, there isn't a hard and fast rule about how much underrepresentation counts as uh, unfair or unreasonable, but there is agreement on how courts generally measure that disparity. The two most common methods for measuring the disparity are absolute and comparative disparity. So absolute disparity is just straightforward math. You take the percentage of a group in the community using census data and subtract the percentage of that group in the jury pool, and that gives you the absolute disparity. So if we use the 2020 census data for Minnesota, the percentage of African-Americans is 5.5%. The percentage in the jury pool is 3.2%. So that gives us an absolute disparity of 2.2%. But as many courts have recognized, the absolute disparity measure is problematic when the relevant population is a small proportion of the community, because the smaller the population, the less striking the numerical differences appear. The comparative disparity measure attempts to uh, respond to this small population problem because it's an um, uh, equation that takes into account the percentage of the group in the community. And it measures the diminished likelihood that members of an underrepresented group, when compared to the population as a whole, will be called for jury service. So it's more likely to register the underrepresentation of smaller groups. Comparative disparity is calculated by taking the absolute disparity, dividing that by the percentage of the group in the community, and that gives us comparative disparity. So for uh, Black people in Minnesota, we know the absolute disparity is 2.2%, which is calculated that on the last slide. And the population percentage is 5.5%. So the comparative disparity is 40%, which means that Black people in Minnesota are 40% less likely to be called for jury service, to be in the jury pool, than they would be if they were proportionately represented. And again, this is just talking about the pool, all of the stages before voir dire. Now, the US Supreme Court has observed that each test for measuring disparity is imperfect. And both absolute and comparative disparity can be misleading when, as is true in Minnesota, members of distinctive groups compose only a small percentage of the community population. In particular, if we use absolute disparity to measure disparity where the population is small, we're going to miss out on meaningful problems. For example, in Minnesota, where the Black population is 5.5%, even if every Black person in the state was excluded from jury service, you would never get an absolute disparity bigger than 5.5%. This is presumably in part why the Minnesota Supreme Court has not relied exclusively on one measurement or another, and has said that the question about representation can't be answered by reliance on one particular standard. And rather, courts should be free to use all the statistical tools available, including absolute and comparative disparity and some other forms of measurement that I didn't describe. The third thing that a party has to show to make out a fair cross-section violation is that this underrepresentation of the distinctive group is caused by systematic exclusion, which the Supreme Court has defined as something inherent in the jury selection system. And Minnesota courts have described as showing that the underrepresentation is attributable to the juror selection process. And again, this inherent issue can be a race neutral, non-discriminatory policy if it has the effect of excluding a distinctive group from the community. And in contrast, equal protection, again, focused on discrimination, requires proof that the disparity was caused by intentional discrimination. So one question that commonly comes up when we're talking about when is exclusion inherent? Uh, is what are the inherent aspects of the jury selection system that can lead to disparity? How do a court's policies uh, lead to underrepresentation? Because there's often a sense that the factors that reduce diversity in the jury system are factors that are outside of the control of courts. But as I'll discuss in a moment, the good news is that there's a great deal that courts and states can do to increase racial and ethnic diversity in their juries. And some of the things that might feel outside of the court's control like undeliverable rates, non-response rates, failure to appear rates, excusal rates, are, according to the National Center for State Courts, the components of jury yield that offer the most potential for effective control. And I'll be, I'll be illustrating that in just a moment. At the final stage of the fair cross-section claim, if the person makes this showing that a distinctive group um, is not represented fairly and reasonably in the jury system as a result of something inherent in the jury system, then the government has an opportunity for rebuttal. 
And the government has to show that whatever aspect of the jury system that's causing the disparity manifestly advances an overriding or significant government interest. And in contrast, the government's rebuttal in an equal protection claim, not surprisingly, it's about discrimination. The government needs to show either that there was no discrimination involved or that the discrimination did not have a determinative effect. Okay, so what are um, the inherent aspects of jury selection that can lead to unrepresentative juries? In other words, what are the factors that feel outside of the court's control, but can actually be affected by policy changes? And this is the good news that I mentioned. This is the, the good news about what courts can do to improve jury diversity. So I have another question that I invite you to respond to in the chat. Which of the steps listed here do you think is most likely to increase jury diversity in Minnesota? Using the uh, rent rebate tax list as a source list, updating addresses on the jury list every six months, sending a follow-up notice to people who don't respond to the jury summons, increasing pay, or engaging in community education? I'm just gonna open the chat so I can see. I see a couple references to pay. Better source list and pay, all of the above. Great. It's not hopeless. That's my whole premise. It's full of hope um, because there is data to support the, um, the, there's data that will support the idea that making some of these changes can make change to jury diversity. So let me tell you about that now. Um, so again, many of the stages where, um, where these choices are made are essentially invisible and in that they don't take place in the courtroom where judges and lawyers can see them. Like if a lawyer uh, uses peremptory strikes against every juror of color, the, you know, the lawyers see that, the judge sees that, if there's a reporter in the courtroom, they see that, uh, it's visible. But most of us don't see the stages of jury selection that produce the group of people who arrive at the courthouse. And we don't see the decisions that are made that determine the diversity of the group of people who are there at court ready to serve. And what I'd like to do is share five policy choices that occur at these invisible stages of jury selection that really have the power to change the diversity of the juries that we end up with. And I usually envision it like this, the, the funnel shape that I have because people get filtered out at each stage of the jury selection process. But here's a, another visual from, uh, this is from the re 2021 report of the Committee for Equality. It's organized as a flow chart. So it's another way of visualizing these behind the scenes stages of the jury selection process. So the first of these invisible stages that can affect the diversity of the jury pool is the selection of source lists. So it's reflected at this stage of the committee's flow chart. It's the selection of source lists. This is the choice about which lists from state agencies become the source for juror names. And it's an important policy decision because the jury pool is never gonna get more diverse than the source lists. If you're not on one of the source lists, you'll never have a chance to be a juror. And that's why very few states uh, rely just on the voter registration list. For example, in Minnesota, the voter registration rate for white non-Hispanic state residents is 83.7% but it's only 55.8% for Hispanic people, 53.5% for black residents of Minnesota and 51.2% for Asian residents of Minnesota. So you can imagine that if a court uses just the voter registration list as a source list, then almost half of uh, people of color would not be included. So that's one of the lists that's going into the mix. But Minnesota also uses the list of licensed drivers and non-driver ID holders. So is that a good list? The answer is it depends. It depends on what percentage of people are on that list and whether the rate of driver's licenses and voter and non-driver IDs uh, varies across racial and ethnic groups. So one question I have is what percentage of people in Minnesota who are old enough to have a driver's license have a driver's license? I invite you to put your uh, suggestions in the chat. 
Because of course the value of a driver's list depends a lot on in that state, what percentage of people have a driver's license. I'm seeing a range, but it actually looks like people are on the money because according to the um, 2019 data from the US Department of Transportation, 61% of Minnesotans who are old enough to drive have a driver's license. So the question is who's not on either of these lists? Who are we missing out on? You know, at least nationally, we have data suggesting that ownership of a photo identification varies by race and ethnicity. So uh, nationally, the data suggests that only 5% of white people lack a photo ID, but that number is 13% for black people and 10% for Hispanic or Latinx people. Photo IDs also seem to differ by income. So 12% of people who make less than 25,000 lack a photo ID compared to only 2% of people who make uh, much more money than that. So the question is what kind of policy decisions at this invisible stage of jury selection would enhance diversity? And the answer is using multiple representative source lists and confirming that they really are doing their job of capturing the state's full community. So lists that might include more members of the community, and again, it differs by state who's on which list, but one example is the list of people who uh, pay personal income tax or the list of people who get a rent rebate on their taxes in Minnesota. So the income tax list was just added as a source list in 2021 by both California and Connecticut and has been used as a source list in a number of states. Another possible list is people who receive unemployment benefits or other public benefits. In 2021, Connecticut added this list and a number of states also use these lists um, for, um, as a jury source list. There are a couple more source list ideas from the 1993 task force report, uh, including the list of tribal eligible voters and recently naturalized citizens, which is a list used in DC. The report also recommended that the statewide rules for public assistance should require that people have a voter registration or, or have a driver's ID or a state ID card in order to get public assistance. I'm not sure whether that was implemented, but it would serve the purpose of ensuring that we have more people on those source lists. Now, Minnesota Rule of General Practice 806B allows for the supplementation of lists, so this is a change that could be made without any statutory or rule change. Another invisible stage of jury selection that has the power to affect diversity are the decisions about who's eligible to be a juror, who counts as qualified. And it's here in this highlighted portion of the committee's flowchart because the summons asks people to respond to the eligibility questions. Now, these eligibility requirements are usually set by statute. It looked like to me that in Minnesota, they're set by court rules that are drafted by the state Supreme Court. And uh, rule of practice 808 excludes people who are not US citizens, who are not proficient in English, as well as people who've been convicted of a felony and are still on probation or parole. Now these exclusions may have likely have a disproportionate effect on communities of color in Minnesota. For example, the eligibility requirement of citizenship has the potential to have a disproportionate impact on the Hispanic Latinx population and the Asian population. Because nationally 37% of the adult Hispanic population is not citizens and 33% of the adult Asian population nationally is not a citizen. And in Minnesota, according to the Minnesota Department of Chamber of Commerce, one in 12 Minnesotans is foreign born. Now 51% of that foreign born population are US citizens already, but some of them in that group are lawful permanent residents. And I, I think I saw that there were at least 150,000 lawful permanent residents in the state in 2019. So one stage, at, one step at this stage of jury selection that could improve diversity is to add lawful permanent residents to the list of eligible jurors. And that's a change that was just made in Connecticut in 2021, um, that lawful permanent residents as well as citizens are eligible for jury service. Another change to eligibility requirements that could help make the list more inclusive is to include those members of the community who have limited English proficiency. And this is the approach taken in New Mexico 
So they provide interpreters for any non-English speaking juror and they're provided to pettit and grand jurors and they include jury orientation, voir dire, deliberations and all portions of the trial. They provide interpreters for Spanish, Mandarin, Polish as well as the indigenous languages of Navajo and Keras spoken by the Keras Pueblo people of New Mexico. And so their model is the one that a number of courts use for deaf jurors, which is to have an interpreter and allow that person to participate in the process. They've been doing that for some time. So expanding eligibility criteria, that's another step that courts can take to increase jury diversity. A third invisible stage of jury selection, where- you know, along those lines, sorry to yeah. interrupt. Okay. Yeah. Of a question comment in the chat along yeah. those lines in terms of the qualifications to serve on a jury um the the commenter noted that these qualifications are solely governed by the judicial branch and they could be changed relatively easily um is that your experience and have you seen other states changing their qualifications via the judicial branch well it's interesting because the states that i've worked closely with um have those eligibility criteria set by statute. So they needed a legislative change. So you saw Connecticut, um, they made a legislative change. So they changed their statute to make lawful permanent residents eligible for jury service. They also limited the time period that someone with a felony conviction would be excluded from the jury pool. And they had to do that through a statutory change. But the building block for the statutory change was a group, was a series of working groups where different stakeholders participated, made recommendations to, to the judicial branch, which in turn made those recommendations to the state legislature. Here it appears, and obviously, you know, I'm in the room, in the virtual room with the real experts on Minnesota, but it appears that those kinds of work groups could make changes to the judiciary because it's the state Supreme Court that has authority over those rules of general practice. So it could be even one step easier here. So point for Minnesota, right? We can make yeah. changes maybe more easily here than other places. Yes, I think that's true. Thanks, Nina. Sure. Okay, so I was just moving on to the third of five of these behind the scenes policy decisions that have the power to affect diversity. And this is the administrative decision about how often to update addresses uh, before the juror summons are sent out. So Imagine that on the flow chart from the committee, it, it appears here in the highlighted space. It's the step of, about updating addresses before those summons go out. And it turns out that this is one of those kind of looks like a boring administrative decision that has significant power to change jury diversity. And that's because in general, undeliverable summons are a big drain on jury yield. That is the overall number of people who come in to the court available to serve as jurors that nationally about 13% of jury summons are returned by the US Postal Service as undeliverable, meaning that the address is no longer good. And um, those undeliverable rates are even higher in urban areas. So cities often have undeliverable rates of between 20 and 30%. And this matters because undeliverable rates are consistently higher in communities of color. This is in turn due to the relationship in our country uh, between race and home ownership. So as you can see from this chart, nationally, home ownership uh, varies by race and ethnicity, and that home ownership rates for white people are higher than for any other group. And in Minnesota, this is certainly true, the home ownership rate for white households in Minnesota is 76% and is only 40% for households of color. And within that group, black home ownership rates in Minnesota are even lower at 23%. Okay, so how does that connect to mailing addresses? People who own their homes are less likely to move than people who rent. This chart illustrates that the rate of the percent of renters who move is always higher than the percent of owners who move, which means that people of color are more likely to move than white people. And in fact, the national mover rate for white households is lower than the mover rate for populations of color. So to tie this all together, when a jury office decides, and they have to decide you know, whether to update the addresses every two years, update every year, every six months, the longer they wait, the more out-of-date addresses are gonna be on the jury list. And those out-of-date addresses are more likely to belong to people of color. And so the jury diversity will be reduced as a result. For this reason, the 1993 report recommended that steps be taken to reach people who might not get to a jury summons due to frequent changes in residence. And this is something that a number of courts have addressed. 
So what's the answer? What steps can courts take? Um, it's simply to update the addresses more frequently and to use source lists that have more up-to-date addresses. Uh, it's freshness, freshness of addresses is what we're going for. So that jury summons are more likely to reach the people to whom they're addressed. So the key here, again, is not just how often does the jury office compile the source list. Minnesota, for example, compiles the source list every year. But if one of the source lists is the driver's license list and you only have to update your driver's license every four years, the jury office might be receiving a bunch of stale addresses. And in contrast to a source list of, say, income tax or unemployment benefits that are more likely to have up-to-date addresses. Now, Minnesota compiles its list once a year, which is um, satisfies the American Bar Association's principles for juries and jury trials, which recommends that jurisdictions update their lists at least annually. But it could be helpful to have more frequent updates in urban areas or areas that have more residential turnover, particularly in a state like Minnesota, where 73% of the population lives in an urban area. And particularly, again, if the source lists themselves might have out of date addresses. And that's the recommendation of the National Center for State Courts that courts that are located in states or metropolitan areas that have higher than average migration rates should consider updating their lists even more frequently, like semi-annually or quarterly. A fourth invisible stage of jury selection or a policy decision at these invisible stages that affects diversity is the policy decision about what to do when a jury summons is returned as undeliverable or when the recipient doesn't respond at all. So this is, I sort of picture it being here on this chart because you've mailed out the summons, it's either returned by the Postal Service as undeliverable or you don't get a response at all. And as I mentioned, the problem of undeliverable jury summons is more significant in communities of color, again, because of the link between uh, race and income in our country. And non-responses also contribute to underrepresentation. So that's a summons to which the jury office never receives a response. And nationally, non-response rates are higher in communities of color. I want to uh, note two important things. One, some of these non-responses are actually uh, people didn't get the summons. So the Postal Service didn't return the summons to the jury office as undeliverable, but the person had moved and didn't get it. Uh, and the other important thing to note is that there's no evidence that response rates differ by race and ethnicity when we control for income. So there's no evidence that Black or Latinx people are less likely to respond to the jury summons but people with less income are less likely to respond. And this is why it's not clear what role community education can play. Because if the issue is that people can't afford to serve as jurors, then it's not clear how outreach that's focused, say, on the importance of jury service or its importance as a component of our civic duty will affect people's ability to participate if that's not the reason that they're not in the courthouse. So one approach to the problem of undeliverables that are caused by bad addresses or non-responses that mitigates the impact on diversity is to send a replacement summons to a new person in the same zip code. So this is the approach that's taken by at least 18 federal courts and a, and a number of states. And this is a quote from one of the federal judges who's the chief judge of the Eastern District of Pennsylvania, which includes Philadelphia. And um, Judge Sanchez says that by resending questionnaires to individuals located in the same zip code, rather than the whole county as, uh, as a whole, the court's hoping to maintain geographic proportionality and representation. That in a lot of jurisdictions, though not all, zip codes are concentrated um, by race or ethnicity. So um, sending a replacement summons to the same zip code can help uh, the court achieve its affirmative obligation to produce a representative jury pool. Another approach for decreasing non-response rates, I, I didn't, this surprised me when I first learned it, I don't think it's intuitive, but it turns out that sending a follow-up notice to the person who didn't respond uh, can be very helpful. And this follow-up notice can emphasize the importance of jury service. Sometimes it just needs to be more clear about how to request a hardship exemption. Sometimes it's helpful to cite the penalties that are available if someone doesn't serve. And courts that send a follow-up notice to a non-responding juror have a non-response rate, an ultimate non-response rate, that's 24 to 46% lower than courts that just send the one summons. Now, it looked to me from the jury plan that Minnesota does send a follow-up notice, 
And so I'm looking forward to learning more about what that looks like, um, what the results are, maybe what language is used. You know, we do have a, a, a suggestion or a thought in the chat. Are any mm -hmm. jurisdictions using phone communication instead of mailing addresses, like texting or, or phone calls to potential jurors? I don't, I think that's, that's got to be the next step. I mean, we all know in our own lives, the role that paper mail plays minimal. Um, but I haven't seen a jurisdiction that initiates the contact with the juror that way. What I do see is that more jurors, and this is the recommendation um, from the national experts at the National Center for State Courts, is that the initial summons just be a postcard that lists the website. When people go to the court's website, they're given an opportunity to input their email and their phone number. And then the reminders, the updates, the, um, I think the, it's not, push notifications come through email and text. And so from that point onward, the jury office can communicate with the juror that way. Yeah, I mean, if we're thinking outside of the box, it would be interesting to see what would happen if, you know, when you went to go apply for a driver's license, you also have to fill out a, a jury card that would have maybe your phone number and your email address on it that then would get included so that we would have some of that information up front. Yes, and I think that could be particularly interesting if, I'm curious if this is true across the board, if people are more likely to hold on to their phone numbers and email addresses than they are to their home addresses. I live in a city, so I know that's true for me. I've had the same phone number in the window of time that I've had 10 different addresses, mailing addresses. Yep. Okay, so I think that brings us that's sort of the, the fourth step that courts could take is to send a replacement summons to a new person in the same zip code when a summons is returned as undeliverable or when there's no response. And in terms of non-responses, it's helpful to add or continue, as the case might be, sending a follow-up notice. And it might be worth experimenting what language on the follow-up notice has the best rate of return. And I will note that anything that increases responses and increases the overall jury yield, that is the number of people who are serving as jurors, is correlated with an increase in jury diversity, but it also makes the jury system more efficient and cost effective. So when you get more people in return for the number of summons you sent out, that's usually a cost saving initiative. And the National Center for State Courts has shown that the cost in sending, say, uh, follow up notices is um, more than covered by the lower number of summonses that ultimately need to be sent out. All right, well, this brings me to this sort of fifth policy decision at these invisible stages of jury selection that can change the diversity of the group of people who come to court ready to serve. And um, this is in the invisible decision. This is one of the, I think, voted most popular in the chat, which is to change how much we pay people and how long we ask them to serve. So in the chart, this is essentially determining of the people uh, to whom we send summonses, how many of them are gonna show up as available jurors. Because jury service obviously imposes an economic hardship. And this affects jury diversity because race and ethnicity are correlated with income in our country. So for example, in Minnesota, um, this is, shows the poverty rate, rate is significantly higher for black, Hispanic, indigenous and Asian communities than it is for white communities in the state. And this makes a difference to jury diversity because people with lower income jobs are less able to miss paid days of work and they're less likely to be paid for jury duty by their employer than are people who have higher paying jobs. So, you know, and you know, we're paying them $20. So that $20 obviously um, means something different to people who are at the different levels of that chart. So the question about what can be done, well, certainly increasing the rate of jury pay and decreasing the length of service, which together minimize the economic burden of hardship. Nina, I don't even know if $20 covers the parking cost. Yeah, well, I mean, it's interesting. This, this category of jury pay can be sort of, it's an umbrella that includes a few different things. So one is the actual rate of pay that the jury gets. One is the amount of time that they're asked to serve. But then there's also the question of to what extent the state covers the incidental costs of parking, transportation, meals in the area of the courthouse, childcare. Um, and then there's another question, which is what demands does the state place on employers? 
So a state can require an employer of a certain size to pay for jury reach service uh, or to um, it can a state can choose to enforce or not enforce the laws on the books about um, penalties for employers who dock or fire their employees for serving as jurors. So there's sort of a lot of steps under this umbrella of how do we reduce the financial burden. But certainly if the pay doesn't cover the parking, um, that's, a, that's pr probably a sign that's a good area to work on. <laughs> Here's an example. This is an older example. Um, this was El Paso, Texas. They increased their juror pay from $6 to $40 a day. I just wanna say this was 20 years ago. So 20 years ago, they were giving $40. But the key is that public participation in jury service as a result jumped from 22% to 46% within one year. And eventually the show up rate climbed to 60%. And a much more recent example is a pilot program that just passed in California. The program will pay low income jurors $100 a day for jury service in an explicit effort to obtain juries that reflect the community. And the Minnesota Supreme Court recognized that pay makes a difference to diversity because as the court recognized, the financial hardship of serving on a jury is not equal. And it's different for people who work for small businesses or self-employed or are low income and have children. And if the state expects citizens to show up for jury service, some further effort to alleviate this concern may be necessary. Another approach that courts can take to tackle the same issue, the economic burden of jury service, is to decrease the amount of time that people have to serve. And the way most jurisdictions do this is to adopt a one day or one trial term of service, which requires people to report for jury service. And if they get assigned that day to a trial, they serve that trial and then they're done. And if they don't get assigned, then they serve their day and they're done. And a variation on this approach was recommended uh, 20 years ago by a different task force. Um, the recommendation was for counties designated by the court to implement a pilot project, a sort of variation, a two day, one trial term of jury service. And this was based in part on the advice of the jury expert who participated in the task force project, stating that nothing would be of greater significance in the effort for jury improvement than the adoption of reduced terms of service. So I'm curious to hear whether that pilot was implemented, what the results are, or how that feels as an idea for moving forward. Certainly shorter service and higher pay are recommendations of the national experts, specifically as a tool to reduce underrepresentation of people of color. So ABA principle um, 2C, and these ABA principles were endorsed by the National uh, Association of uh, State Court Judges, which is, includes the chief, this, the highest state court judge in each state. And principle 2C recommends the courts adopt the one day, one trial term of service, recognizing that reducing the term of jury service is essential to achieving a representative and inclusive jury. Similarly, the ABA recommends that going to Corey's comment, the reasonable fee should at a minimum defer the costs associated with serving as a juror. And again, the comments recognize the link that excuses from jury service because of economic hardship reduce the representativeness of the jury. And similarly, the National Center for State Courts has recognized the relationship between the amount of juror fees and minority representation in the pool. And I would say that when thinking about what is the right amount of pay to provide to jurors, it's not very useful to think about, well, where do we rank in terms of other states? Because you can't tell someone, you can afford to serve as a juror, juror because we pay more than Idaho. Instead, we have to think about juror pay in terms of what money is that juror missing out on in order to participate? So it's gotta be linked more to at least state minimum wage um, because the references to other states or other jurisdictions where in most jurisdictions the pay is inadequate um, won't be as helpful or won't have as meaningful of results. So increasing pay and decreasing the length of service is another step that courts can take that will increase jury diversity. So I wanna end just by emphasizing the good news that there is a great deal that courts and states can do to increase jury diversity. And by summarizing um, in a single slide, the changes that I suggested for Minnesota, it's not an exhaustive list. And you know, I really hope and expect that you'll have additional idea, idea, ideas and ideals. <laughs> um, so the recommendations for achieving jury diversity in Minnesota include adding source lists uh, that may be more representative, 
expanding eligibility requirements. So considering the inclusion of lawful permanent residents or people who could serve on juries if they had an interpreter. Third is updating the addresses on the jury list more frequently or using source lists like taxpayer lists that include addresses that are more likely to be accurate. Fourth, sending out replacement summons when summons are returned as undeliverable or when there's no response at all. And fifth, include, increasing the rate of juror pay uh, or requiring employers to pay jurors and decreasing the length of jury service to one day or one trial. And now I just have one last question. This is the last poll question that I wanted to ask the group, but you know, you know Minnesota, you know your communities and courts, and I'm really curious which of these policy changes you would identify as the top priority. There's no right or wrong answer. I'd just really like to see what you think. Oh, interesting. Okay, so we've got increase the rate of juror pay in the lead and adding source lists and updating addresses. Again, it's not like one has to choose one or the other, but resources are scarce. Time and energy is scarce. Sometimes it's helpful to identify a place to start. So I'm just gonna minimize that and keep that. And I want to um, close with this quote from the Minnesota Supreme Court, which I think of as both an admonition and a promise that we will not be satisfied until the reality and the perception of the underrepresentation of African-Americans and other distinctive groups um, are eliminated. So thank you very much. I look forward to hearing from the other speakers and to hearing your questions and suggestions. I already saw a few good ideas in the chat and I look forward to following up with people on those. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nina. Um, we did have a few questions about your presentation that I wanna cover quickly before we move on to the panel. And, and that is, what do you think about the pilot project that was recommended in 1993 to allow Hennepin and Ramsey County to adopt new jury selection procedures that would actually guarantee minority representation on the grand jury? Um, you know, honestly, I don't know that they ever, this predates me. So um, John, I don't know if you know, or if our other panelists know, but I don't know that any of those pilot projects got off got off the ground. I, I haven't seen any. Um, I know one of the other recommendations in the 1993 task force report was to provide childcare. I certainly know that that's not happening. Um, one thing that I noticed in terms of the differences between the 1993 report and the current 2001 report was that the 1993 report did seem to have some concrete steps that it wanted uh, the system to make. And the, I, I know that they're not in practice now. I don't know if they were tried and, and didn't go anywhere, but I know that many of them are not in practice now. And it appears that now we're kind of going back again to sort of restudy the problem. Um, so uh, I don't know, for those of you who have practiced for a while in Hennepin or in Ramsey, were those pilot projects that you had seen? Put it in the chat if you have. Um, the other co um, comments or questions that we had related uh, to uh, interpreters, how could those be used? You know, I have not had an, a case where I've had an interpreter used um, for a juror. I have had cases where interpreters were used for my client and for witnesses, and they were used in he uh, using headsets. And so that was how that um, was accomplished throughout the trial. You know, the interesting question that comes up and that was raised by Anna was, well, what happens? Does the interpreter then go back into the jury room with, with the juror? I would assume that would be yes. Have any of the panelists experienced that? Or Nina, is that something that you've seen put into practice in other states? And again, if you guys have experienced it in the chat in your practice, pop it in the chat. I'd love to know what, what your experience is. We've got one. Yes, that is what happens with ASL interpreters in Minnesota. So yep, they go back into the jury room. It looks like that is the current practice. And I see head nods from uh, Judge Viola as well. Um, another question that came through the chat uh, that maybe we can ask quickly of, of Nina before you go is, why are we not implementing procedures that could guarantee a racially diverse veneer and jury? Specifically, why can't we redraw from the responding summons pool if there are non-white jurors initially drawn? So is it possible our place is drawing just larger panels to begin with and then bringing in more diverse people into a particular courtroom? Has anyone experienced that? 
I'm not seeing anything. I will tell you, I had a case in Scott County recently where I did file um, a motion for a representative jury. And it seemed like the judge was bringing in more jurors than typical because of maybe that it was also a first degree case. So it could have been that as well. But yeah, um, you know, I, I don't see anything prohibiting courts from bringing in more jurors than they typically would. Um, I don't think there's any obstacle to that. I, I think in general, um, you know, you have these competing and kind of inconsistent vibes of the constitutional amendments. So the Sixth Amendment allows us to recognize that in the aggregate, different groups have different life experiences. That means they have different perspectives that they're bringing to the table. And that's why it's such a huge loss if we don't have people from those groups in the jury system. On the other hand, the Equal Protection Clause tells us that we, when it comes down to individuals, don't want to make assumptions that this uh, potential Black juror is going to have a particular perspective. And because those two drives are a little bit inconsistent, recognizing that in the aggregate, race and ethnicity make a difference, and then un being unwilling to recognize or impose that as a prediction about an individual puts those two amendments in tension, which I think is why the Supreme Court at least ended with the conclusion that will require fair cross-section for every stage except the individual jury. What we do know is that the data suggests that it's really those invisible stages and that determine who walks in the courthouse that ultimately changes who sits on juries. That although the peremptory strike piece can make a difference, it, it can't serve to exclude all people of color if there are enough people of color in the room in the first place. And so I think one of the pieces that I'll highlight and just close out with this thought that a lot of times the attention is on the role of peremptory strikes, but the few studies that have looked at this and I think this was reflected a little bit in the 2021 report for Minnesota, is that the biggest drop in representation is coming from the community to who shows up at court. It's not coming from who shows up at court to who ends up on the jury. Thank you. So I wanna move on to our panelists now at this time. And I, I would like to hear from each of you sort of, what do you view your role both personally and professionally as? Um, why is this work important to you? And what is your what is your role and what is your responsibility in your professional role? And um, Ms. Brown, I'll start with you. And just for a refresher while she's getting ready, she is the court administrator in Detroit. Thank you, Corey. So personally, it's important to me because being a woman of color, being part of the judicial system, I wanna make sure that people feel like they are getting a fair trial, that the public sees that the process works, justice works and have confidence in that, in that system. And my role as far as being the court administrator is basically going back to what Professor, Professor Charnoff was explaining, those invisible pieces, looking at our source lists and realizing that there may be some gaps there looking at our processes as, as far as we, we send out our notices, the, uh, the non-responses, the non-deliverables, what do we do with that? How do we address that? And working with our judges to go into the community, working with the schools to build this um, sense of responsibility that when you do get a jury summons, it's not something that you just toss away. So they know that it's very important to show up. I love the ideas that Professor Chanoff shared as far as, you know, working to increase the compensation for jurors. Working in Detroit, we have a large minority population. We also have a lot of people who are at poverty level or struggling economically. And we have to look at that as a reality. If I have a choice between getting $40 to serve on a juror or working a full day to get a hundred plus dollars, it's a hard choice. And I would like to have the incentive way where that person comes in for jury services. So definitely looking at things like that. Um, I'll share more after the others have joined in. I don't wanna you know, monopolize the time. Thank you. I'll move to you, um, Mr. Choi. Um, tell, tell me about why, what, is, what it is about this that resonates with you both personally and professionally and what is a prosecutor's role in all of this? <laughs> Well, um, Corey, thank you for the question. And I just loved how you kind of framed uh, the issue at the very, very outset, talking about how oftentimes in the justice system, as practitioners and people within that system, 
we'll often look at it in silos or from our own perspective. And, and Nina, I thought like the, the information and, but most importantly, the solutions about how we get to a more uh, fair and representative juries, there are all of those ideas. I can't think of one reason why we wouldn't want to do that uh, or try to implement and try to make those changes. And so the, for me, the, 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 the issue is that we, we need to do this because to the extent that we don't, uh, we have issues with our legitimacy and trust uh, with our justice system. And I love the fact that, because um, I was going to really touch on this, but I think it was brought out throughout the presentation that Nina gave, but you went back and forth to 1993, right? That was written a long time ago. And I think in many ways in this country and in our justice system, because for a number of reasons, we have this pattern that we have where people will raise these issues uh, but nothing ever changes. And I will call out that the reason why it never changes is that it's because the people that are calling out the change oftentimes are not the people that are in power. And so I think we need to have a sense of urgency. I believe that the solutions are actually found not so much in the adversarial system. I don't mean to diminish the work that happens amongst practitioners uh, every day. Uh, but we're not going to find the answer or the solutions through the adversarial process. It will actually be through uh, collaboration and working together and recognizing what we can agree on. And then also to recognize this fundamental point that we don't do enough in the justice system is to recognize that our solutions and our answers and a lot of the ideas that Nina is talking about, uh, they originate and generate from our community. And when I say community, I mean everybody. And oftentimes the way that uh, the pattern that works out in communities across America is that oftentimes the, the, the communities that aren't represented are not the ones that are at the table. So that's the work that we've been trying to do in Ramsey County to think about things in a, in a different way. And I will just also point out, because I have this opportunity to do it too, I think too, that you know, to the extent that we're talking about criminal uh, law uh, uh, cases or uh, how we process all of that, it's baked into our DNA and also into our constitution in the Sixth Amendment. And since that time when those words were written, uh, we've operated under the assumption that all of our answers and solutions to a better justice system are found within that adversarial system that everybody has a right to a trial. And we put so much effort and, and effort talking about all of this. And I think it is one of the most important aspects of the justice system to make sure that we have fair trials. But I just want to call out the fact that it's only about, uh, it's less than 5% in many jurisdictions, it's less than 2% of what we actually do. And there's a lot of other work that needs to be done uh, to improve the quality of justice for everybody. Thank you, John. I'm going to move now to Judge Viola. Um, tell me from the perspective of a seated judge, what, what is your role and why does this speak to you both professionally and personally? Thank you, Corey. I, first, I want to echo Zanel and John's statements because I think uh, what, what they presented is absolutely correct in terms of perception. From my perspective, playing a role in the process is why it's important to me because if I am personally involved in someone's trial, I'm overseeing jury selection, I'm involved with uh, the jury returning a verdict, I want to make sure that what I'm doing is consistent with what needs to happen in that process to make it fair. And I want to make sure that my life's work personally, you asked about personal reasons, my life's work uh, has value and that it's meaningful. And, and in order for that to be true, I have to adhere to the constitutional requirements uh, that have already been addressed, but also to make sure that the perception, and I think a lot of this, a lot of this is about perception for the public, that the perception is that we have a system that is fair and a system that's worth preserving and worth protecting. And the way that we do that is by implementing some of the things that have been talked about. So as a stakeholder, I see the importance of my role as being intricately involved in the process and needing to make sure that we just don't give lip service to you know, we can make changes and, and recommendations are out there, but that we actually figure out how to implement them. Because I think at the end of the day, if there isn't confidence in the system, and again, I think John's point about so much of what happens, particularly in the, in the criminal side of things, is, is um, not necessarily jury trials, but that's where all the focus is. And that's the perception 
of the justice system in large part is directly tied to what happens in trials and how we perceive the fairness of the, the jury process. So from my perspective, it's important personally and professionally to make sure that we do the best job that we can in bringing in those people and educating the public to make sure that, that, that they're aware of the importance of, of jury service and the more we can do to adopt some of the, the measures that have been discussed, not in Arizona necessarily, but just across the country, I think is going to push us in that direction. Thank you. I wanna talk a little bit about some of the changes that you all have seen in your communities. Um, and Ms. Brown, I'll circle back with you. you. You started to touch a little bit on the community piece of, of really how your organization engaged the community and made some deliberate attempts to engage the community. Um, I, I also would like to hear about, I, I believe that you also saturate certain zip codes or go back to certain zip codes more frequently. And I'd like to hear about both of those pieces. Definitely, our, our judges have made a commitment to go out into the community, to talk to the very civic groups that are there, to talk to the very ethnic um, racial organizations within the community to show the importance of them showing up for jury duty. We've also used like our social media, we use TV media. And when we get to a point where it seems like jury service has just reached like the bottom of the rung as far as priorities, then our court looks at, okay, what type of enforcement mechanisms we can use. And our enforcement isn't driven to put anybody in jail. Our enforcement is driven to bring the person who missed their day in court, their day for jury service in court, and address them and to give them that one-on-one -on -one lecture from the person wearing the robe. And then to schedule that person to then appear again to perform that jury service duty. We also, in our jury services area, we, we reach out to, to the schools. Our jury services director does like mock jury trials and hosts tours throughout the, the courthouse as well. Again, if just like an Apple product, when you start giving the information to the generation while they're young, they grow up with it and you know that you're training them to expect certain things from your product. And that's how we do that. And definitely when we're looking at the zip codes, we ask people, the jurors, as they're leaving out from their services, we ask them about the satisfaction. We ask them you know, to self-identify so we can figure out what races are showing up or where we're lacking at. And then we use that information again to, to do some outreach efforts there. And that has definitely been important to us. And, and we've incorporated even jury services appreciation days along with our administrative offices at the Supreme Court level. So it's a holistic approach, gathering the data, putting the information into the community and then having the leadership follow up and follow through on the initiatives that have helped us. Thank you. And it strikes me that, you know, um, the onus is not necessarily on the community to show up, but the onus is also on us as, as members of the justice system or criminal system to make sure that we're making it accessible for people to show up. Yes. Um, and um, uh, Judge Viola, I think I would circle back to you because I know that you were on a task force that came up with some concrete recommendations for change in your jurisdiction. And I'd be curious to hear about what those were. Sure, and let me just correct the record. I'd love to take uh, the, the uh, promotion to being on the task force. I, I served on a, a local task force for our, our Maricopa County Superior Court, but we did have a statewide task force uh, that was shared by one of my colleagues. And, and that's where the recommendations came from. So just to, to, to clarify, um, I don't wanna take on uh, the, the role there. But having said that, as part of our Supreme Court strategic plan uh, from our chief justice. Uh, the chief justice does have one of his points in the plan is promoting public trust and confidence. And in an effort to fulfill that strategy uh, toward doing that, the chief justice did create a task force on jury data collection practices and procedures. And that task force made recommendations on data collection, source lists, et cetera. Some of the concrete recommendations that I think are relevant to the discussion here, and I think just serve to um, support what Professor Chernoff discussed, was increasing juror pay. And the specific recommendation, whether or not it will be implemented is a different question because it's going to be a statutory change that would be necessary by the legislature. But at least from the task force recommendation, it was to increase the daily rate of pay to a rate equal to four times minimum wage, which would be approximately 49 or $50 per day. 
Also in Arizona, we have a lengthy trial fund. So trials that are six days or longer, jurors can receive compensation for up to $300 per day. So another recommendation was to reduce the length of time uh, before that lengthy trial fund would kick in from day four to day six. So it would be much more frequent that people would be able to take advantage of that. Additionally, they recommended uh, by statute uh, to permit additional payments to qualified jurors who require dependent care to serve on a jury. And I think that goes to one of the issues uh, that was maybe not specifically addressed, but you know, it's not just a matter of compensation. It's a matter of, well, if I have to take the day off work, and I have to pay somebody to care for my child because I otherwise wouldn't have to do that or, or whatever the circumstance is, um, that factors into jury service as well and a barrier to service. And so the, the recommendations, uh, I think, largely related around uh, pay in terms of overcoming barriers to service. There were a lot of additional recommendations that were made, many of which are very consistent with the things that Professor Chernoff suggested, so I won't necessarily take the time uh, to go through those, but I think it's important to, um, to highlight that that's at least where our task force identified some of the significant issues in terms of um, uh, barriers to service related to pay. And, and just one last point I'll make, they, they made an interesting recommendation, which was legislation to allow working jurors to receive compensation from their qualified employers or day one through day three of jury service, and then the employers would receive a tax credit. So it was a sort of a different approach that wasn't specifically mentioned in the presentation that I thought might go to um, what, you're, what you're talking about. Thank you. Um, Mr. Choi, what are your thoughts about some of the changes that you have seen and what, what have you faced or encountered in terms of barriers to change and how do you address those or take those on? I think there's a whole spectrum of things that uh, have been put forward here that uh, Nina talked about, but also that's also go back to 1993. Some are going to be harder uh, to implement because it might involve the legislature. But one thing that I think somebody called out, I think it was you, Corey, that much of this is actually can be changed through judicial rules, right? And so I think in many ways, the, the, the power is actually within practitioners to suggest these rule changes and working with the bench to see what we can actually change. I, I from my perspective, and, and this is not any criticism at all, I see a lot of studies and task force reports and recommendations, but not a real commitment to maybe follow through on the action because the, the question is, how do you get that going? And so I think maybe this is a call to action for all of us, uh, and especially those who are practicing in the field of uh, in criminal law, uh, but, you know, when the prosecutor and the public defender can agree on something, oftentimes that does occur. And if we can engage judges on that, I think um, a lot can change. And so maybe that's where we need to actually start is instead of having all these. I know there's a study that's going on by the courts now, uh, but at the end of the day, if we really want these things to change, we actually have to work on them. And so I certainly would look forward to and actually be open to the opportunity to do that with uh, local justice leaders here uh, in Ramsey County to start that conversation. And it can only start unless somebody says, let's start working on the things that we can, can get done now and then work on a longer term strategy around um, the ones that might be a little bit harder, but might be more effective, like the jury pay, I think could actually make a huge difference. But to get that done, you'd have to probably go to the legislature and get an appropriation. One of the things that I have, uh, you know, actually one of my lowlights for this week was when I found out that Jim Fleming, uh, the Ramsey County Public Defender would be retiring. And because I've really enjoyed a, a really collaborative relationship with him, I'm a better county attorney because of him. Um, and so Hopefully, uh, whoever that new person is who will take over that office, it might be an opportunity to work on uh, this particular issue because we're all going to benefit when we have more trust and legitimacy uh, with regard to what happens in our judicial district. Thank you. Yeah, you know, it was, it was funny. I was wondering the other day, uh, what, what would it look like if when the defense made a motion to say, hey, we don't have a diverse jury? I mean, what would happen if the prosecution was like, yeah, sure don't? You know, and then it's really left up to the court to, you right. know, instead of us fighting about it, well, I mean, can we not just all agree like, oh, here it is, you know, it's, I mean, 
no pun intended, black and white in front of all of us to see. Like here, here it is. It's not representative. Um, judge, what are you going to do? I, you know, maybe that's not fair. I don't know, Judge Viola. Has that ever happened in any of your courtrooms before? It's not happened to me personally, and I don't know that I've had or heard anecdotally that it's happened to any of my colleagues. But I think to that point, one of the things that we saw happen in Arizona, I think that speaks to what may be the ultimate result is that our Supreme Court ultimately abolished preemptory strikes effective January 1 of this year. And while that doesn't address who comes in the door, I think it serves to recognize what was happening in, um, in our jury trials and what was happening in the courtroom when preemptory strikes were being used in ways that perhaps were not the way that they were envisioned. And so I do think that there are results that can happen when that is raised. That was a, a rule petition uh, that was proposed by two of our appellate court judges that was ultimately adopted by rule change uh, by the Supreme Court. But I think it's an important question. I, I don't have a, a, a real life experience with it in terms of an answer, but I do think that what we've seen here uh, is kind of the equivalent of what would happen. That's the kind of thing that will happen when uh, things are challenged. Well, and one of the things that is interesting about our system here in Minnesota is that they, they found that the problem isn't necessarily with peremptory challenges. The most recent study actually showed that um, it, if we have uh, Black and African American jurors that are on the panel, they're actually more likely to be impaneled as seated jurors. So our problem here really relates more to getting the right people in the door. And frankly, you know, if you're not getting the right people in the door to begin with, taking away peremptory challenges doesn't fix the problem. It might even uh, exacerbate it. So, can I can I add one thing, Corey, though, just for something to think about? I, I don't disagree with you necessarily, but the percent going back to my comment about the perception, I think if the system is uh, is presented in a way that the perception is not, if you might be a person of color, you're you're likely to get struck. And I understand you're saying in your jurisdiction you're not, but when that's no longer an issue in the trial maybe there is a little bit more buy-in at the front end for jurors to be willing to come to court and participate, assuming that they're making that conscious choice as opposed to I can't afford it or you know I can't take off work or whatever the issues are. So I just think, I, I think that's such a big issue. It's hard to sort of compartmentalize those, those points. Mm -hmm. I just I add, oh, Corey, I just wanna jump in to say a quick point that I think some of those benefits about showing people the extent to which we're seeking to include them in the process can also happen when we publicize the efforts we make to these behind the scenes changes. So when we talk to people, um, share publicly why we're expanding the source list, or we explain why we're asking people for race and ethnicity data on the qualification forms, all this can be publicized as another way of communicating separate from the peremptory strike piece about, um, we want you here, you belong, and you're welcome and you'll be included. Yeah. And I think that goes to the broader conversation of, yes, um, how are we being welcoming as a community? How are we keeping people out of being involved? And how are we bringing people in to being involved? To, to Mr. Choi's point earlier, who's got a seat at the table at all of these conversations? You know, I know that many of these conversations are taking place on different levels, but I, I did not see a lot of community organizations um, at the seat of the tables at some of these studies that Minnesota has done. So I think that there's an opportunity to reach out to organizations like Ujama or Better Futures or all of our different community organizations, Neighborhood House, um, that are really doing work in our communities and making sure that they're, they're here while we're talking structurally about what changes to make. Um, I see that we are starting to run out of time. I wanna make sure that we hit a couple of these questions. We did have a comment again about that 1993 um, pilot project that was in Ramsey and Hennepin County. Um, they didn't ever get out of off the ground. Um, and they, the, they said um, it was apparently due to vague equal protection concerns. So curious about what your thoughts were on that, uh, Nina. I want to answer, but I also see Monica looking at me. <laughs> Monica, uh, I don't not, want to get you, you can You can answer, Nina. I'm not looking at you. I'm just, just present. I'm just hovering. I think it's hard to answer a question like that in a short amount of time because it's a kind of thorny issue. And I do think that certain times sort of fears about violating equal protection 
keep us from making small changes that actually don't threaten equal protection concerns while meeting and satisfying fair cross-section goals. I would say that one of the best judicial opinions I ever read, read was the special concurrence by Justice Page in the 1997 case, Hennepin County versus Perry, where Justice Page tackled that exact question, the need to have that sort of affirmative jury selection and did a better job than I could ever hope to for describing why that might be an important worthwhile approach. So I'll type that link into the chat and that'll be the response. I would also add that it is a conversation that I think that our society and community is ready for uh, because what Justice Page said in that concurrence and what he has advocated throughout his judicial career uh, is starting to emerge. Uh, and really, it's a distinction of how we think about um, justice and how we think about equality versus equity and understanding what the difference is. And that's what that concurring opinion actually calls out. And I do believe that um, as we have evolved as a society, we are ready for that conversation. We should have it. Thank you. Um, I, I oh, I just wanted to announce to everybody what the CLE code is for today. Um, we were approved for 1.5 elimination of bias credit. The CLE code is 439-753. It is 439-753. And you know what? I'm just going to pop it in the chat very quickly here for everyone. Um, so I just, I put it in the chat for all of you. I want to thank all of our panelists. I want to thank all of the people that showed up. Um, as I said in the beginning, I was at first a little nervous about having a training that encompassed everyone. I was afraid we would all start fighting with one another, just like we do in court, but we did not, because I do think that this is an issue that we all care about and we want to make some changes. So I guess I will leave you all with a call to action. Let's tear down the silos. Let's start having conversations at the local level. We don't need to leave it just to, um, you know, the, the committees that are doing this at, at the high level. We can start on the local level. We can start in our offices. We can start um, with simple conversations with the, with the prosecutors and the defenders. And maybe we can all agree, yeah, not fair. So thank you everyone. And um, with that, I will see y'all see back in court.